Um, I'm going to talk about the acutely withdrawing patient in the ED. So this is Pliny the Elder, right, most famous for ascribing the natural history, Historia Naturalis, in the first century CE. And he was the first person to describe alcohol withdrawal. He said the following, Drunkenness brings pallor and sagging cheeks, sore eyes, and trembling hands that spill a full cup, of which the immediate punishment is a haunted sleep and unrestful nights. All right, so how do we honor this great thinker, this polymath? We named a beer after him. What's, you know, how do we discover that alcohol withdrawal led to all this bad stuff, right? Seizures, a delirium tremens, alcoholic hallucinosis. We did it the old-fashioned way. Before IRB, we experimented on prisoners, right? So Isbell, 1955, took nine male prisoners, forced them to drink a lot of alcohol for six to 12 weeks, and then forced abstinence upon them for two weeks. Okay, two out of nine had seizures, six out of nine developed DTs. And that's an actually really high rate of development uh, of DTs compared to what we now know to be the incidence of DTs among alcoholics, but it was the first sort of co uh, cognitive link between chronic ethanol consumption, abstinence from ethanol, and this clinical syndrome that we're going to describe. You've probably heard, how many have heard that DTs has a 50% mortality? Anybody heard that? Yeah, so that data comes from 1912, Boston City Hospital, and among their alcoholics admitted with delirium tremens, the mortality is 52%. And of course, supportive care has come an awful long way since then. So that's not, uh, that off-quoted figure is not true anymore, but it's still a serious disease, and it gives you an idea of how if we don't do really good supportive care for these folks and take care of them, they're at, at high risk. What's the pathophysiology? I think everybody knows at least the, the first part of this, right? So ethanol use stimulates GABA-A receptors. So GABA-A is a pentameric chloride channel. It's an inhibitory channel. And the more you beat it up with alcohol, the more it downregulates, right? Same thing, it antagonizes NMDA receptors, so it does the same thing that ketamine does, or dextromethorphan does, right, or PCP does. And so they get, they get antagonized, and therefore the body upregulates them, right? Now, take away the ethanol, and you've got loss of that GABAergic inhibition, and you've got all this excess excitatory tone, right? If you take a brain and you, you grind it up, and then you spread it out on a slide, and you do immunohistochemical staining to figure out what the proportion of relative receptors is, you, you're amazed that we're not seizing all the time. We've got so many stimulatory synapses in our brain, right? And the only thing that keeps us from just flipping out and going into status all the time is that we have this chronic inhibitory tone from GABA. So we're going to talk about four syndromes. We're going to talk about early uncomplicated withdrawal. We're not going to talk about that very much because it's pretty straightforward, right? give them a dose of Librium or something, or they go home and drink, and then they're usually fine. Um, alcoholic hallucinosis, and we're going to make a distinction between alcoholic hallucinosis as an entity and alcoholic hallucinosis as part of this syndrome called delirium tremens. We're going to talk about alcohol withdrawal seizures, and then finally we'll get to the DTs. So this is a timeline. This isn't, uh, <clears throat> this isn't sort of a hard and fast rule, right? But this is sort of the idea of What's the gross timeline of somebody who goes on to develop delirium tremens? And when did these various phases of alcohol withdrawal occur, right? So here you've got, in the first, like, day or so, you've got minor symptoms, anxiety, insomnia, gastrointestinal upset, some headache, anorexia, right? This is the mild withdrawal that sometimes self-treats or is self-treated. Alcohol hallucinosis, usually one to two days, and usually goes away within 48 hours. We'll describe that in more detail. Withdrawal seizures are a within the first two days kind of phenomena, but sometimes they occur pretty early, like six or eight hours. And then finally, if you, if you wait it out long enough, and as we'll talk about, if you are destined to go on to this, because not everybody is, people have one, two, or three of these things, and they don't necessarily develop DTs, then you get delirium tremens, right? The syndrome of delirium, dysautonomia, agitation, hypertension, peaks at five days, lasts about seven days. People have talked about it going on longer, but that's definitely the exception ra rather than the rule. Oops, we're going backwards here. All right, so how do you assess for alcohol withdrawal in a, in a sort of intellectually honest way, right? So, you know, we, don't, we all used to also do the I know it when I see it for this, right? But there's a number of validated tools that can help us understand how bad somebody's withdrawal is. And one of them is CYAR. Right, so that's Clinical Institute for Withdrawal Assessment Alcohol Revised. It takes about five or ten minutes. In most places, there's a protocolized administration of this by nurses in the ED and elsewhere in the hospital. And the score determines the severity of your alcohol withdrawal. So a score of 8 to 15, you have mild withdrawal, 15 to 20, moderate withdrawal, and greater than 20, severe withdrawal. 
What's the caveat with this? This is not designed to diagnose or guide treatment in alcohol withdrawal in people that are really sick and kind of decompensated and falling apart, right? So a couple of reasons for that. One is, in order to do a CYAR, you have to have two things. One is, you have to be able to talk and be understood, right? And the other thing is, you have to have a history of recent alcohol use. Well, there's a nice series out of the Mayo Clinic that looked at people who are getting CYA-based treatment with benzos in the hospital and how many of them met those criteria. Turns out 48% didn't have either criteria and about a third had only one or the other criteria, right? And you can think about what's on this score, and we're gonna talk about it in the next slide, how these things might be adversely influenced by comorbid medical or surgical illness, right? And that makes it really difficult to suss out who's moderate or severe. You've got a trauma patient, yeah, they might have nausea and vomiting and diaphoresis and tachycardia, right? Their sensorium might be clouded. You can have the choice of giving them symptom-guided benzo treatment inappropriately, or you can use something else to figure out what's going on and guide their treatment. Okay, so these are the CWA components, nausea, vomiting, tremor, diaphoresis, anxiety, agitation, tactile hallucina ha hallucinations, auditory hallucinations, visual hallucinations, headache, and clouding of sensorium. So in addition to the things that we all know to ask about, tremor, agitation, hallucinosis, altered loss of consciousness, altered level of consciousness, you want to ask about things like nausea and vomiting, paroxysmal sweats, headache, and anxiety. How about this early withdrawal syndrome, right? This is as early as six hours, and I think anecdotally we've all seen it probably even earlier in people that still have a pretty high level. Uh, it's a dysautonomic syndrome, so the primary thing is tremor. It's a rapid intention increased tremor. You can see a little bit of dysautonomia, like mildly increased blood pressure and heart rate. If they have a temp, it should be low. For this, it should be less than 100.5. Even in the fulminant delirium tremens, the literature says that you don't usually see a temp greater than 39 Celsius. If you do, it's probably something else. Peaks at 24, 36 hours, resolved in a couple of days. Most people don't progress beyond this, right? You've, you've probably interviewed people in the ED and you've said, hey, have you had alcohol drop before? Yeah, well, I've gotten shaky when I've stopped drinking. Well, how long have you been able to be abstinent after that? Well, a year, and nothing ever happened, right? This is when patients self-treat. So the patient who's not interested in stopping drinking, they go home, they have a few whiskeys or a few vodkas, they take the edge off, and the symptoms abated. So one of the things that's been borne out in the ED literature is assessing their readiness to change, right? Performing a screening and brief intervention. If they are ready to quit drinking, then I will give them a long-acting benzodiazepine. So like something like 25 of chlorodiazepoxide, Librium, or 10 of diazepam, uh, Valium by mouth and send them home. Uh, if the literature suggests that it's a CYAR is less than eight, they can be safely managed as an outpatient. I will tell you that I personally don't prescribe benzodiazepines to folks. Uh, who are, uh, even if they say they're interested in quitting drinking, because I think the problem with benzos is not that they're unsafe by themselves. The problem is that they're unsafe when they're synergized with other things, right? And so if you don't want your patient to go home and pull a Janis Joplin or a Jim Morrison, you don't want to be the person that writes that prescription necessarily. I think if you give them something that's oral and long-acting enough, their symptoms are mild enough, they should be treated through the physiologic period of withdrawal, and then they can enter whatever outpatient, intensive outpatient or inpatient or whatever treatment program that they want to have if they're really motivated. How about alcoholic hallucinosis, right? So everybody's seen this painting. This is um, the absinthe drinker, 1901. I think it's Victor Oliva. And this was a big, big deal in the Art Nouveau period. Apparently everyone was just having a great time, you know, hanging out, sipping absinthe, painting. This is 25% um, of withdrawing patients, right? Starts within four to six hours after your last drink. And the interesting thing about this is they tend to be pure visual hallucinosis or tactile hallucinosis, right? Like formication, I've got ants crawling all over me, I'm seeing pink elephants crawling up the walls, right? If you have auditory hallucinosis or you have command hallucinosis, right? The voices are telling me that I'm a bad person, I need to drink Drano to cleanse my insides, that's probably schizophrenia, that's probably not withdrawal, right? Lasts for about 48 hours, and the, the crux of identifying pure hallucinosis versus DTs, right, is it's delirium tremens. You have to have delirium. So you have to have a disorder of consciousness or cognition, right? Waxing and waning, fluctuant consciousness gives you DTs if combined with this and dysautonomia. This by itself is plain old alcohol hallucinosis. And you can treat it with antipsychotics and you can do that safely. We'll talk about why. Alcohol withdrawal seizures. First two days phenomenon, right? We said first two days after a decrease or cessation of alcohol consumption, uh, most in the first six to 12 hours. The classic alcohol withdrawal seizure is one seizure, a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. It doesn't happen again. You have a short post-dictum and you feel better, right? If you see something else, 
focal motor seizure, you know, focal seizure with or without uh, impaired consciousness, you should think to yourself, could this be a CNS lesion? And am I missing some focal cause of seizures and not alcohol withdrawal, okay? 40% uh, of patients have a single seizure. If it's multiple, it's usually only a couple. It's always six or less in the literature. The post-dictum is short. Uh, and there's usually a lucid phase in between, right? So if somebody seizes, they come back to normal after short post-dictum, they seize again. That's okay, that can still be alcohol withdrawal. Status is pretty rare, like three, five percent. So again, if you have a prolonged seizure, if you have a localized seizure, have an abnormally long post-dictum, or you have status, think about another cause, right? People who drink a lot fall a lot. People who fall a lot hit their head a lot. Usually chronic alcoholics, you can see this in binge drinking. There's something about binge drinking that seems to lower people's seizure threshold acutely, but mostly it's chronic alcoholics with withdrawal. It occurs in up to 10% of untreated patients with alcohol withdrawal, and a third of patients with DTs start with this, but it doesn't mean that of all these patients, a third of them will go on to develop DTs, if that makes sense, right? No reliable predictors of who's gonna have a seizure. Uh, it seems to recur in people if they've had a seizure before they may seize again. So treatment with benzos reduces recurrent alcohol withdrawal seizures, but there's no role for conventional anti-epileptics, right? And we said that, that makes sense because these people don't have a scar or gliosis or an irritable focus in their brain. They just have a GABA deficiency, and you can replace that any one of a number of ways, right? They replace it with vodka. You replace it with benzos. Differential diagnosis, acute head trauma, intracranial hemorrhage, uh, toxic metabolic disarray, right? These aren't folks who necessarily take great care of themselves. They can have hyponatremia, for example, from beer potomania. Um, acute poisoning or toxicity from other things that people might ingest, certainly on the list. Epilepsy, right? People do have epilepsy and alcohol use as a comorbid disorder. I will say that if you go work a shift in a county hospital, of the 20 alcoholics that come in that all have a prescription for Dilantin that they haven't filled in three years, I would say maybe one or fewer has epilepsy, right? This is just our peers practicing badly and diagnosing people who have alcohol withdrawal seizures and giving them anti-epileptics. This is delirium tremens. This is the beer with the 50% untreated mortality. So true DTs, right? This is, the, this is the good stuff. This is where people are really, really sick, right? Occurs late. So it's usually a two to four day after cessation, two to four day after last drink kind of phenomenon. Supposedly it can be as late as 14 days. I'll tell you that that the time that I see it delayed like that is when somebody comes inpatient in the hospital and we do something to them that kind of resets the clock. And the classic example of that is general anesthesia, right? General anesthetics are great anti-epileptics, right? It's like way down here on the refractory status algorithm. And so what happens, you know, somebody falls down, they break their leg, they're a big drinker, their last drink was on Friday, they get, their, they get through Saturday okay, Sunday they have their surgery. This isn't true, obviously, because no one has surgery on Sunday. But let's say Monday they have their surgery. Um, they get, an, they get uh, internal fixation, and for that they get a bunch of sevoflurane. That seems to reset the clock on their withdrawal, and they may not withdraw again until Tuesday or Wednesday. Mean duration of DTs is four or five days. At the outside, it really should be about a week. Uh, and four to six percent of untreated withdrawal patients go on to develop DTs, right? That's opposed to the two-thirds that was reported back in the prison study in 1955. So the real rate is probably much, much lower. What are the risk factors for developing DTs? Well, you had DTs before, right? And I think most of us know to ask about that. Have you ever been so sick with alcohol withdrawal you got admitted? Have you been so sick you were in the ICU? Were you ever intubated, right? History of periods of prolonged drinking, that kind of goes without saying. Age greater than 30, where does that come from? Well, it just comes from the fact that in most parts of America, people can't drink enough chronically for long enough to develop DTs until they're at least 30. We see people l younger than 30 with DTs all the time in Arizona, right? We see like true pros. They might have grown up on the reservation for the native folks and started drinking when they were 11. And we see folks with uh, delirium tremens in their 20s and cirrhosis as they approach 30. It's pretty sad. Um, alcohol withdrawal in the presence of an elevated alcohol level makes sense, right? You think this is a marker of your professionalism as a drinker, right? If I can withdraw with a level of 265 milligrams per deciliter, I'm probably a pretty sick person. My alcohol consumption is pretty high. It doesn't really fall out, right? Because you can imagine there's some people that get really sick because they're at level of zero when they present. There's some people that's level 100 when they present and they're just really attuned to it. It's kind of mixed bag across studies. 
So DTs is a symptom complex, right? You have to have the delirium part before you have the tremens part. You have to have some disturbance in your, in your consciousness or cognition. It's usually fluctuant. People are up and down. One minute they're talking to you, the next minute they're out of it, the next minute they're confabulating. Uh, accompanied by tremor, agitation, delusion, hallucinosis. They can get a fever, though it's usually less, we said, than a 39. Tachycardia, the sweats, hyperreflexia, right? All of this is the unmasking of their, uh, their sympathetic nervous system. Respiratory alkalosis is pretty common from hyperventilation, so that's just centrally driven hyperventilation on a gas. Most of them are real dry. They have real high insensible losses. They may not have been taking care of themselves. Alcohol is a pretty good ADH inhibitor, right? So they often need a lot of IV fluids. And all of the nutritional electrolyte deficiencies that you see in alcoholism are common with these folks. Hypomagnesemia, hypokalemia, they're probably all thiamine deficient, right? Because they have a thiamine wasting enteropathy. They may be deficient in folate and B12. So nowadays, mortality is somewhere, somewhere less than 15%. So that's much better than we used to do in the bad old days. And it's usually due to dysrhythmias or some concurrent illness. Like you're in the hospital with DTs, you get a lot of sedation, you get pneumonia. High risk, as you can imagine, if you have concomitant liver disease, if you're old, if your lungs are terrible, or if you have a temperature greater than 40, which is probably not a marker of DT severity, it's probably a marker that you have something else bad besides DTs that wasn't treated, like pneumonia or sepsis. So how do you treat folks? Well, you gotta evaluate all the medical problems and treat them, especially alcohol-related illness and infection, right? People get pretty sick, do a good physical, Studies has indicated, you know, not many of them are useful, but it's probably worth getting electrolytes, perhaps liver function. Um, scoring systems, we said, not useful nor validated in severe alcohol withdrawal or DTs. So if you look back at the validation cohorts for CWA AR, their average CWA scores were like 9 to 11. So they're not a very sick group of people. These are people who are like quasi outpatient treatment where they checked voluntarily into an inpatient detox, right? What does the literature say about symptom guided therapy? It says it's better, right? It says it's better in that population where it's validated. It's better because people get less pneumonia and people fall less, right? It makes sense. If you're only treating people who are withdrawing, you're not gonna snow everybody. But again, in this population, it's not very useful. And we'll talk about, at least until you get to the point where you can use uh, symptom-triggered therapy when they're kind of out of the woods. So this is a picture of me before I got a Peloton bike. Um, you wanna do a complete physical exam. You wanna look for head trauma, infection, uh, GI bleeding, the stigmata of advanced liver disease, as you see here, and focality on the neuro exam, right? In the world of tox and withdrawal, if somebody's got a real focal or a lateralizing neuro exam, then tox is a diagnosis of exclusion, right? So you want to figure out first if it's a, if it's a structural or anatomic lesion. Chest x-ray, if they're hypoxic or you think they have pneumonia, not unreasonable. If they aspirated, you know, it might be worth seeing that. Um, the jury is sort of, you know, always favored not initially treating what is probably aspiration pneumonitis in the first 48 hours, but these people can get pretty sick and your local practice might vary on that. Think about a head CT, it's a first time seizure, if it's different, if it's status, if they have initially okay mental status and it gets worse. Um, you know, this subdural hematoma or acute and chronic subdural is so common and I know we all are cognizant of resource utilization, but this is a patient population that's pretty high risk that you're gonna miss something if you don't image them. Uh, volume resuscitation, thiamine, 100 milligrams IV, right? IV and not PO, right? And the reason is, remember, it's a thiamine-wasting enteropathy. That's why you can't just add thiamine to Guinness and make people in Ireland not get Wernicke's, right? That's why. It's because they don't absorb it. So you got to give it to them IV, okay, at least at first. Multivitamin, folate, replace mag, right? And then seizing of tons of patients, make sure you check the glucose, right? There's this phenomenon that's mostly a child's phenomenon, of um, alcohol-induced hypoglycemia, but adults can get it, especially if they're malnourished and chronic alcoholics. Banana bags are kind of a big waste of money, right? They've been studied. They're not any better than just doing these things separately. They're more costly because your pharmacist has to compound this stuff, so I don't, I don't ever order them. Okay, now we want to treat this person with bad alcohol withdrawal, right? So, you know, the way I like to approach this as a kind of a tox-oriented person or a pharma-oriented person is, what are the characteristics of the ideal drug? If I could make up a drug, right, I would want a drug that was a GABA agonist, right, that had a really rapid onset of clinical effect. Because I want to go into the room, titrate the drug, and then leave and go see 14 other patients. I don't want to be standing there for three hours trying to get the dose right, right? I want it to have a short time to its peak clinical effect, and then I want it to have a really long elimination half-life, right? I don't want it to be short-acting, because I don't want to go in there 
spend my 15 minutes titrating my drug to get the perfect effect of the person mildly sedated, their alcohol withdrawal is looking so much better, and then I walk away and an hour later the drug's worn off and they're withdrawing again, right? That makes no sense, right? So we actually have some drugs that are pretty close to this ideal pharmacologic profile. Uh, the best example I can think of is probably diazepam, right? If any of you have ever done one of the, the uh, mandible reductions that Ken was talking about, right? Sometimes you can give a naive person like five of diazepam, and they kind of become almost unconscious for a minute if you push it IV, and they sort of look around at you, and then you put their jaw back in, and then they come, you know, they wake back up, and they're like, oh, what happened? You go, listen, don't do your taxes for a day, right? So diazepam behaves pretty well like this. Lorazepam is okay, right? And we'll talk about why people favor it, but the thing that's not ideal about it is it takes too long to reach its peak clinical effect. It probably takes more like 15 or 20 minutes as opposed to the five or so minutes for diazepam. So you can't really stand at the bedside in a busy ED and give pushes of you know, doubling doses of lorazepam because you gotta wait too long. So uh, diazepam, in my opinion, is almost an ideal drug when given IV for this. Let's look at this thing. This is an example of what happens if you give the same bolus dose of a drug multiple times at a fixed time interval, right? And how that affects your serum concentration of the drug over time, right? So here we go, we're giving dose one, then we give dose two, dose three, right? And you see it creeps up, and then over several doses you approach your steady state, and you kind of vacillate around the steady state if you either start a drip or you keep giving bolus doses. Well, think about this, you could change the axes of these to say, you know, GABA A receptor occupancy on the Y axis, and time on the X axis again, and there's probably some imaginary level that goes right across here, and if all those receptors are occupied, the person's not in trouble. They're not withdrawing, right? So the goal is you rapidly titrate your drug until you get above that, that level, right? And you want this drug with a really long half-life. You want your perfect half-life is five to seven days, right? Because you want this thing to just kind of auto-taper itself out, right? I told you I'm a big fan of Ron Popeil medicine. Set it and forget it, right? I want to spend 20 minutes in the room. I don't really want to look at your family photo album. I want to get you out of withdrawal. And then I want you to like just kind of go be okay. Right? And I know that if I admit you to a very, very busy hospitalist with 25 patients on their list, and they more or less ignore you all night long, that you're still not gonna be in fluid withdrawal or progress to DTs, right? So how do I get this series of bumps to get me to that level high, uh, more quickly? I double the dose each time, right? So as an example, I have some professional drinker comes in and what looks like early severe withdrawal, I'm gonna give 10 of diazepam, five minutes later I'm gonna reassess the patient. If they don't have a little bit of lid lag, they're mildly sedated, they're kind of calm and cooperative, I'm gonna give 10, uh, 20 of diazepam. Five minutes later, I'm gonna give 40 of diazepam. Five minutes later, I'm gonna give 80 of diazepam, right? And then usually once I give 80, I can't find a nurse that will give more than that, so then I just keep giving that, okay? Um, and that's gonna get you to your level quickly, and then the idea is diazepam is a long elimination half-life, it's got two active metabolites, you just sit on them, right? And then when they look like they need to be treated again, they've probably just petered just below that level where, where they need a little more receptor occupancy, and you can kind of kick them back up with a little more modest dose. Benzos, we said, are the mainstay of treatment. It's a GABA agonist. It leads to sedation, of course, but it's indicated in almost all patients with alcohol withdrawal. You, know, you may not have diazepam. There's a nationwide shortage, I believe, of IV diazepam right now, so that's okay, but the main thing is pick one and stick with it, right? Pick a treatment, stick with it. The most annoying thing is when a patient comes upstairs and they've gotten you know, two of lorazepam, 10 of diazepam, one dose of oral librium, a little touch of phenobarbital, right? And you don't know where you are, you don't know when these drugs are gonna kick in or, or have they kicked in yet. That makes it really, really hard to titrate your therapy. Um, goal, rapid upfront titration, give it in escalating doses, right? You want the patient sedated but arousable, that's kind of your perfect zone. Benzodiazepine resistance, this is a real thing. So you can uh, chronically condition mice to ethanol, and what happens is the alpha subunits of their GABA channels undergo a rearrangement, and they become resistant to benzodiazepines. The benzodiazepines don't bind as well, okay? So people define this clinically different ways in humans. So some places have said, if you give 100 of diazepam in an hour and like really nothing happens, or 200 days of payment an hour and nothing happens, that person's probably benzodiazepine resistant and you have gotta try some other tactic for uh, treating their alcohol withdrawal. So that's a nice segue into phenobarbital, right? Phenobarbital was a long time ago a frontline drug, then lost popularity for a while, and now is kind of back, and back with a vengeance. People are into it and I'm into it. I think it can be and probably should be the first line drug in treating alcohol withdrawal. It's great for front loading, right? We said you wanna load them up, get that dose up high and then let the thing auto taper, right? Phenobarbital is incredibly long half-life, so the ideal is that you would give one or two doses up front and then you would never have to do anything to the patient again and their withdrawal is treated for the better part of a week. 
Uh, a good starting dose, if they haven't gotten a bunch of benzos, is 10 mg per kg IV infused over about 40, 45 minutes. The diluent can cause a little hypotension. But you have to be careful with this. You want to give them at least 30 or 45 minutes before you go back and say it hasn't worked because this is a lot slower onset of effect than the IV diazepam or even the IV lorazepam. This uh, you can look at on your own time, but this is um, from MCRIT uh, or by way of PalmCRIT, and this is a kind of a sample protocol, and it's one that I uh, agree wholeheartedly with, as how do you use uh, phenobarbital for ethanol withdrawal treatment, uh, and how do you redose it if you need to redose it. Propofol, I don't like it uh, because you can make somebody who's really sick look really good on it, right? You intubate them and you knock them out with propofol. And this is a great way to see what delirium tremens looks like for the medical student every single morning for a week, right? Because they go up to the ICU and then they do a sedation holiday every morning. And as soon as you turn the propofol off, 15 minutes later, they're having DTs, right? So it's not ideal because it redistributes too fast. Adjuncts, ketamine, little bit of limited literature about this. Uh, it at least has a pathophysiologic rationale, right? It's an NMDA antagonist, just like alcohol. So there's a small series at a University of Pittsburgh where they use doses of about 0.18 milligram per kilogram per hour, and it seemed to be a useful adjunct. I will tell you, they didn't randomize people this treatment. They didn't have a control arm. You know, they basically gave it, and they said, hey, it made people look good, and we gave them less benzodiazepines than we thought we were going to have to give them. You know, I think that, that shows some promise, uh, but it's not really been well-supported or well-validated. Dexmedetomidine, I think, is okay for basically like a, a heart rate and blood pressure treatment, right? It's not a terribly powerful sedative. It doesn't have the right mechanism of action to treat the, the main problem in alcohol withdrawal by receptor, right? But we said it's, an, it's a kind of anti-autonomic drug, and there is some dysautonomia here. So if I've gotten somebody who I've sedated really well with diazepam or with phenobarbital, and they look really good in every way, except their heart rate is like 130 and their blood pressure is 180 over 110, I might add on a dexmedetomidine infusion and just make their vitals normal so they don't have some secondary bad medical outcome like an MI or you know, demand ischemia while they're sitting around getting treated. Antipsychotics, don't believe this stuff about antipsychotics lower the seizure threshold, therefore you can't give them. Of course you can give them. You just gave this person 10 mg per kg of phenobarb, right? Five of Haldol or 10 of Zyprexa is not gonna make them lose their mind and have a seizure or status epilepticus. So you know, treat the GABAergic problem with benzos or barbiturates treat the hallucinosis with antipsychotics. That's what they're for, right? Beta blockers, limited evidence, again, might be useful for just pure dysautonomia. I have a little persistent tachycardia. Everything else looks good. Okay, probably good to try a little bit of metoprolol. Uh, clonidine is basically oral dexmedetomidine, but it's much harder to titrate, as you can imagine, and it's an enteral formulation, and a lot of these folks are kind of out of it, and they may not be great at swallowing when you're treating them, right? Who do I admit? If CYAR is greater than eight, most of those people should come into the hospital. You can't control them. They have something that makes you worried about their seizures being more than alcohol withdrawal seizures. If they have DTs or severe disease, uh, if they have social issues that force them into the hospital, or if they can't walk and eat, obviously, you gotta bring them in for treatment. Discharge, none of the above. You watch them for a few hours. Their CYAR stays less than eight. You can give them a dose of a long-acting oral benzodiazepine and send them home. You know, it's up to your discretion whether or not you think they can go out with a benzodiazepine prescription, but I'd be cautious, you know, particularly in this era of the opioid epidemic and us being unjustly blamed for it uh, with giving them a very large or long supply of benzos, particularly if you're not confident that they're not going to return to drinking, and most of them will. So what are the take-home points? Alcohol withdrawal has a really predictable spectrum and time course. Delirium tremens has to have delirium. You have to have disordered cognition or consciousness in order to have fulminant DTs. Diazepam or phenobarbital, in my opinion, are the best first-line agents to treat this disease, and the strategy you want to do is this front-loading strategy. Get them good, and then hopefully mostly leave them alone. And then for severe alcohol withdrawal uh, or DTs, we said rapid titration followed by a symptom-triggered maintenance is an ideal strategy. So what I'll do is front-load somebody up at time zero to day one or two, when I think I've got them pretty good, and then they're gonna go upstairs, they can go on CWA, right? They can go on CWA with IV diazepam or IV lorazepam because all we expect to happen is that their drug levels will fall just enough that they start to withdraw again, and then that one or two of, of lorazepam is gonna work, rather than cause somebody to be way behind because you're using a scale that's designed for minimally ill patients, and you're treating somebody who's really sick, right? You only get to scale them every hour. You'll never catch up. You'll never catch up. They're always gonna be behind, all right? Thank you so much.